I'm a corporate finance lawyer who works principally with startups and venture capital firms. Uh, I've been at Fenwick for over uh, 20, about 25 years now, time flies. Um, and during that time, have worked with hundreds of startup companies, um, not quite as many venture capital investors, but many venture capital investors and focused exclusively on technology companies. What we're going to cover today is uh, some of the issues that come up with very early stage companies that can have negative imp implications going forward for your business and things to think about early on. Um, I think we're going to skim the top of the waves on this because this, any, any one of these things could be a quite an involved presentation. Um, and also, I'm mindful that different uh, people in the audience may have different levels of understanding and experience with, with companies and startups and these types of issues. So um, I'll try and calibrate uh, accordingly. So first of all, um, and I can see some people in the class barely if I squint my eyes, um, how, many of you, how many people here have started a company before or are starting a company? Okay, I see one hand. That's great. And I'm and if you're <laughs> online, you know, feel free to text because I think these are th these are issues that are going to affect you um, directly in connection with your startups. These are legal issues, but they also dovetail into running the business as well. So the first the first issue is forming a legal entity um, before you get started with any momentum in your business. That's important because it forms the basis for one deciding ownership of the company. It also provides a vehicle for allocate, for, for holding um, assets of the company, not only cash, but also intellectual property and development. Absent a legal entity um, and absent a contract defining who owns owns, you know, developments, IP development software, the software uh, would be owned by the people developing it. And so that's why forming a legal entity is important. There's also, for startups, this is less important, but it's still a value, um, is it's a limited liability vehicle. So um, liabilities of the corporate entity or legal entity, if it's an LLC, are limited to uh, the entity and cannot um, creditors, claimants of the company cannot seek assets to the assets of the, of the investors. There are some narrow situations where that isn't the case, but for the most part, it provides isolated liability. As a general matter, there are a couple of different questions you're gonna to need to ask yourself um, as to what the type of legal entity is you wanna form, um, when to form the entity and so forth. I think in terms of the type of legal entities, the two we see the most frequent are corporations and limited liability companies. Um, the basic difference between the two is there are two, two general differences. Corporations are typically, although you, you, can, you can elect to, to be treated as a partnership, but typically are taxable entities, meaning they pay taxes based on any profits that they earn. LLCs are what are called pass through tax vehicles, where the tax the entity isn't taxed and any profits and losses are passed through to the owners. Um, far and away, the most common form we see in uh, with technology companies who are raising venture capital is corporations. Um, most uh, oftentimes uh, venture capital funds are restricted to investing into pass through vehicles like LLCs. And so they require that the entity, the company that they're investing in be structured as a corporation. Um, the tax treatment 
frequently doesn't matter early on since oftentimes corporation, the, the, the startup is not generating profit. It's simply developing and spending money to develop its product. So it's running losses. Um, one of the advantages of an LLC is you can pass those losses on to the, to the members, to the founders, but those can only be used to offset gains to the extent you have investment or similar gains. Uh, they, you can't use uh, uh, operating losses from LLCs to offset sort of ordinary compensation. So this slide shows some of the attributes of a limited liability company. They're, they're typically owned, uh, used for services businesses or closely held businesses like restaurants. You don't see, you, you, you see, sometimes you see them used for technology companies, but it is, as mentioned, it is not the most common structure. The other thing about LLCs on the plus side is they're extremely flexible. You can structure the LLC and the rights and obligations of the members uh, in a way by, in, in any way that the members agree by contract. Um, a corporation tends to be more restrictive in terms of what you can do. You can still um, agree on different types of rights and obligations, but, you're, but it's less flexible. As mentioned, the LLC is owned by members who take, Usually, it's they take either membership interest or um, units in the LLC. Um, liability can be limited, like a corporation. Um, however, it is taxed as a pass through, as mentioned, um, similar to an S corporation. Formation of an LLC is very simple. It just requires filing a one page. Certificate of organization, although typically all the rights and obligations of the members, including fairly complicated tax provisions, are spelled out in an operating agreement. One of the downsides about um, an LLC is it can be more complicated to grant or issue equity to employees, unlike a corporation. Um, it's, it's, it can be much more, it can be, one, it's less well understood by employees. And two, it can be more complicated. This slide sort of provides a high level overview of corporations. They are owned by shareholders and they're governed by a board of directors. The board of directors has what are called fiduciary duties to the shareholders. That means they are charged with managing the corporation for the exclusive benefit of the shareholders. And there's a whole bunch of law that has developed around those obligations and what those mean. Liability as mentioned is limited, to, is limited uh, only to the shareholders investment. That is liability of the corporation. Corporation C corporations are uh, subject to tax at a corporate rate um, and also will pay taxes on any dividends that are that shareholders might uh, receive, and so potentially there are two levels of tax that shareholders have to pay with a corporation. One is they're subject to corporate level tax, so the corporation first place tax on its profits, and then to the extent that corporate earnings are distributed as dividends, they also pay tax on that um, uh, on proceeds from a dividend that are received. Uh, formation is fairly simple. It's a, it can be a one or two page certificate of incorporation that is filed with the state of incorporation. And with both LLCs and corporation, the specific rules governing those entities are defined by the state in which it is organized. So each state has different rules for its corporations and its LLCs that are formed in the state. Um, the most common jurisdiction uh, for startup companies in the Silicon Valley is uh, Delaware, as you may be uh, familiar with. Um, it generally has the most management favorable set of rules and has sort of emerged as the go-to place for forming companies. 
the I'm, I'm mentioning just the S corporation here, which is like a C corporation, except it's taxed like an LLC. So it, it doesn't have any corporate level tax or has a very small corporate level tax, but all par- profits and losses are passed through to the shareholders. There are restrictions though that are required for a corporation to be treated as an S corporation, which make it not attractive for venture investment. There's only one class of stock allowed and there are restrictions on the number and type of shareholders that can be permitted to hold S corporation stock. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Yes, let me expand the screen. Is that better? I assume, I, I assume it is. So that's the sort of a quick thumbnail uh, about entities. Um, the, the, the most important takeaway is um, that it's important to form those early and uh, before you get going um, much on, on development of your, of your venture. And it will be the vehicle which, as I mentioned, you can allocate ownership uh, of your new company and Um, which will hold title to the assets and developments that are developed by your employees and service providers. So that's that's important. If you go, um, let's say you do not form a corporation early and you just sort of operate informally with you and your co-founders and you develop products that gain some value, have some significant value, then when you go to form the company, there can be negative tax ramifications to the founders um, at the time they, they form their new company. Because the normally when we form uh, a new corporation, the founders will pay for their stock either with very nominal amount of cash, uh, because at the time they form it, ideally the corporation is just a shell, and or a contribution of any then existing IP. If the, if the developments of what you've developed are worth a lot, then there's the potential that the founders could be subject to tax on formation of the company. So that's one reason why we generally advise founders to form a corporation early um, in, in, their, in the process. So I'm... Moving on to the sort of second issue here, I'm not, probably not going to cover all 10 of these. I'm just going to touch on the most important ones, and then people should feel free to ask any questions either um, verbally um, in the class or through the chat. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to respond to those real time or, or at some other time. Second most important issue is making sure that the company owns all the IP that it has developed or it is using. Initially, IP that the founders have developed is brought to the company and assigned to the company. Um, There are, let me me back up for a second. There are two issues that this touches on. One is founder-related IP that is developed, and the other is employee-related IP that um, is developed um, either before they become employees of the company or while they're employees of the company. So the first thing when you're, when you're forming a new company is it's extremely important to make a clean break with your prior employers. If, if the founders are working for a different company, it's important to make sure that there's no argument that the prior employer has rights to the IP that they're either gonna be developing at the new company or are being assigned into the new company that they've developed. Um, And um, that can be a tricky endeavor because oftentimes founders do not wanna leave their current employer until they have enough traction with their new company to make sure that it's something they wanna pursue absent you know, and, and pursue full time and leave their their um, their current employer. Um, one of the things that I'm sure many of you are f- familiar with is, as a many companies, almost, almost exclusively all companies, will require employees to execute 
uh, documents that make clear that anything that an employee develops in the course of their employment with their employer is owned by the employer. And that can be a pretty broad assignment of IPs. That invention assignment, it's called an invention assignment agreement, is similar to a uh, agreement that you will sign as a part of your new uh, company that you're forming. And so it's important to make sure that those two agreements don't conflict with each other and that there's not ambiguity. And the issue will be is that in future financing rounds with your new company, investors doing due diligence will want to know how did you leave your prior employer? Does the prior employer have any potential claim over IP that you've developed or that the new company is using? As mentioned before, pre-incorporation or pre-formation IP um, is usually used as consideration to buy your stock in the new company. And so that IP, if you're going to pay for your shares with that IP, it's important that you make sure that you have title to it and that, um, again, that your prior employer or some other um, party does not have rights to that IP. It's also important to make sure that anyone who works for the company, consultants, employees, founders, assigns all the IP to the company when, they're, when they are working for the company. And as mentioned, it is um, almost uh, universal that companies will have all employees and service providers sign an agreement where they agree that what they're developing is owned by the company. There's a, that, that agreement also covers confidentiality as well. Um, I remember I had a, a client who um, was starting a new company and before they had started the new company, they had engaged consultants on a very informal basis to write code for their new company that they were going to use um, as the foundation for uh, the new company's product. Uh, the problem was, is that with a consultant, um, unlike an employee, um, unless an uh, IP assignment is included in a contract with the consultant, the consultant is, is by default sort of owns all the IP. And in this case, the company had failed to get that um, assignment language executed by these former consultants. And this came up as part of due diligence and a financing, and they had to go back and try and get uh, assignment, IP assignment agreements executed by these offshore consultants, which was a tricky, a tricky endeavor, uh, given that it was occurring in the midst of a financing. And so it's important on the front end that you make sure that the assignment is executed by employees and consultants uh, up front. So what is IP sort of broadly speaking? It's basically any idea, know-how or invention uh, that can be used uh, that, is, that is not tangible personal property. And this, this slide describes some of the forms of which uh, intellectual property can take. I think everyone is sort of familiar with patents, copyrights, and trademarks. Those are each different types of intellectual property. But aside from those uh, well-known categories of IP, there's also things like, like know-how or software or formulas, um, confidential information can be considered intellectual property. So all of this is considered intellectual property and all of it would be covered by an invention assignment agreement. For some types of intellectual property, you'll get protected automatically under law. For other types, you have to register with a government agency, either at the federal level or the state level, um, the IP. And this protection, it's important to know that the law gives you the right to prevent others from using, I mean, prevent others from using your right. It does not, it does not give you the right 
to use the, the work creatively. So that's a, that you may say, well, if I can stop others from using my patent right, for instance, doesn't that in fact give me the right to use the, um, to use the technology that's covered by the patent? It does by in implication, but if somebody has a patent that um, is, uh, that they can allege um, is superior to your patent, then they can prevent you from using innovations and patented IP that is covered by your uh, patent. It, all, it, it, is all ex it can get extremely complicated. For the most part, I would say that with respect to patent rights, most startup companies um, have very little to gain by pursuing a strategy of patenting their innovations. Um, certainly, patents of softwares have very really limited um, utility. Uh, but I think also most companies choose to protect their IP through means other than by patent. I'm going to put up a chart here that sort of show, gives you sort of an overview of the different types of intellectual property. Oh, sorry. Trademark, which is branding and logos, copyright which is actual literal expression that can be software code, can be content on a website. Trade secrets have value by virtue of the fact that they're secret, i.e. the Coke formula isn't patented, uh, it isn't copyrighted, but its value is the fact that it's secret. Um, contract, of course, you can create confidential information and then patents are with respect to inventions and cover new technologies. I'm gonna move on to the next category here, which is an issue that comes up quite a bit with new companies and early stage companies that um, are hiring from other who are poaching employees from other um, companies. So it's important when you're hiring somebody who is currently working at another company um, to understand what restrictions that person has on their ability, A, to disclose information to you as the new employer, B, actually work for you as a new employer, and some of the things that can affect you know, whether or not the employee is able to work for you are things like moonlighting clauses that prohibit employees from engaging in other business activity during employment. So if somebody's employed and they're sort of advising you on the side. You have to be sensitive about this. Non-disclosure, certainly you want to be careful about accepting any confidential information from an, from an employee of another company. Non-competition clauses, those are, those are generally unenforceable in California, um, but there are many other states that enforce non-compete clauses, certainly during employment, by another company, but also after employment for a reasonable period of time. And then there are non-solicitation and no hire clauses. Non-solicitation clauses provide that the employee will not solicit you know, employees of their employer for a certain period of time. Those are generally enforceable even in California. No hire clauses are more controversial. And I think, um, uh, California and generally not enforceable in California. All of these things are things to be careful about. And I've had situations where clients have hired employees who have violated their obligations to a former employer. That not only calls into question what they're doing for uh, the new company, but it also can result in liability for the company as a result of hiring that person if they should have known or did know 
that they were violating an obligation to their prior employer. So it's something to be careful about. And I, and I am well aware that the competition for employees these days is absolutely fierce. And it's one of the, it's one of the most important things that companies have to focus on. This last point, common law duties for key employees, all employees under California law, and I frankly think it's every state, have an existing duty of loyalty to their existing employer to act in that employer's best interest. This is in addition to whatever contract, confidentiality contract they may have signed. This is a duty that is imposed by law. Um, and so it's important that as, a new, as somebody who's trying to hire an employee, you don't, you're not deemed to sort of aid and abet a violation of this duty. Okay, I'll pause here for a second to see if anyone has any questions. I, I, it's, a, it's a very quiet group here on a Friday. I guess not. Um, this next issue is one, as a startup lawyer, I see quite frequently taking on new clients. Oh wait, here's a question. What can you protect by IP? Um, that is an extremely complicated question, but it is a fairly broad category of innovations that you can protect by IP. You can protect information. Um, there are requirements in the case of patent rights. There are requirements to be able to have an enforceable patent. In the case of trademarks and copyrights, which are very different things, there are separate requirements. So this, this is unfortunately an answer that does not lend itself to a simple explanation. So yeah, suffice yeah, to, uh, suffice I, I, to say, suffice to say that um, when, um, when you hire new employees and or when founders join a company, the invention assignment agreement that they um, end up signing that basically says, you know, anything you develop, uh, any innovation, um, design, uh, software, it's a very broad definition of what is IP is owned by the company. That, 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 is, that is extremely broad. So that relates not necessarily to protection, that relates to the fact that the, the company would own that quote IP. But um, the, the requirements to be able to um, uh, have protectable and enforceable IP vary from the type of IP that you're, you're, you're seeking to, to protect. I'm sorry, I, I, I may have cut off somebody. No, it was me. Just I, I wanted to speak up because uh, it was me, the one who asked the question. And basically, the reason why I asked is like sometimes you may protect something very specific, but sometimes there are things like you just change something and then you're doing something different. So I see kind of like fuzzy the line of where IP is really, let's say, meaningful. Like maybe for like, like uh, I don't know, like chemical formulas, it makes sense. But for the for like maybe businesses, sometimes it's more about how you do things rather than the specific. Um... Specific IP. Um, I I I would say, um, Gonzalo, that's right. Um, I think you want to be very. Um, thoughtful about whether or not, for instance, you would go to seek patent protection of a certain type of innovation because obtaining patent protection, which is called prosecuting a patent, is, is a long and can be an expensive process. And that's why a lot of startups don't, don't do it. And, and ultimately, what is actually enforceable is not clear. Um, yeah, and can be challenged thing. in the future. That's the Anything, thing. So as a startup, if you actually invest a lot of time and money, and then you end up having a patent for something really specific that someone else can come and then like 
do something a bit different that also works, then like, is it worth really going through the whole process? Right. No, that that's right. And and with a startup, I think what's more critical to your survival is cash flow, right? I mean, cash is and having funding early on is much more important than the possibility that a patent might be valuable to your company. And as I said, for most software-based companies, patents are going to provide not really significant value. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going myself through the process, so that's why I was asking as well. You know, I'm talking like kind of like from my experience. No, it's, they're, 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 they're very good points. I would say that on the, um, on the IP assignment issue, you want to be very broad. You want to get every employee to sign that um, agreement, and you want to make sure that you're not really focused on what they're doing, what they're developing, but you want to make sure that if they develop something of value, the company owns it. That, that's more important. Um, I see we got another question that says, at what point you, uh, in the startup journey should founders begin to sync legal counsel? Additionally, would you be able to estimate what the percentage of startups that have waited too long? I think it, I think it really depends. I think the big issue is, are the things you're gonna be doing early on gonna be structured in the proper way? Or if you wait too long, and your business has developed um, and you've engaged in a fair amount of development uh, and or you know, transactions that have complicated things, um, will that A, result in you know, additional cleanup work that you're gonna need to do after the fact, which will cost you more in terms of money and or two, will it be the type of thing that could actually jeopardize your ability to raise money? And a lot of these things we're talking about in this, 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 10, this list of 10 things that, are, that could kill your business, these are things that if they go to the, the nth degree could really be serious things that could jeopardize your ability to raise around. My experience is, is that almost anything is early on is fixable. It's a function of, you know, how much more is it going to cost to fix it and unwind things? Um, and so that would be, that would be my answer. I would say that oftentimes founders come to us, you know, after they have formed the company by themselves, issued, tried to issue founder stock, and have raised a safe round uh, or a convertible note round, and then come to us once they're doing a, a priced financing. You know, in my mind, that's too late because um, one, it, it, won't, it doesn't mean that the company won't be able to raise a price round, but there is almost 100% of the time we end up having to go back in and unwind things and fix things that have been done incorrectly and it ends up costing the client more than it needs to. So, you know, if I was to generalize about this, Varav, about what's the right point to involve counsel, I would say that sort of, I think once you're into deciding to issue uh, either equity to employees or you're going to raise funding, that's when you should involve counsel. Ideally, we like to get involved when the company is actually issuing shares to the founder or founders. So, um, this next issue is one of the things that can get messed up if you don't involve counsel early enough in that your capitalization, that is, that means your, the shares that you issue, your ownership structure of the company is not standard and is too complicated. Investors care about this because this is what they're buying a piece of. You can, you can think of an ownership of a company like a pie. And on day one, the founders own 100% of that pie. And each time the, the founders go out and either raise money 
or grant in equity to employees, they're slicing off a piece of the pie to give to that constituency. And so it's, in, it's incredibly important, sort of going with my analogy here of a pie, to make sure that your pie is very standard and that there's not a lot of unusual things. For instance, one of the things that I've seen from time to time is promised equity to people who in the past had helped the company or the founders. It might be post-formation, it might even be pre-formation, where a founder in an email has promised somebody a certain percentage of the company, just in an email. This is sort of what the allegations that were made in Facebook by the Winklevoss brothers. But that can be a really big issue because once the company is at a point where it's raised money and it's got sophisticated investors who are looking at investing and they do their due diligence, they will want that cleaned up because they don't want to invest in a company where somebody can argue that they should, be, they should own a certain percentage of the company. So that is one thing I would be very careful about is promising equity to um, people in a way that is not uh, well understood. So that was one specific example, sort of going back to the slides here, at a high level, keep, first of all, document everything, no emails, no promises of equity. Um, and also plan out what your financing plans are for your venture. Understand the potential dilution at each stage you raise money um, and or need to grant options to hire employees. Um, focus on what the projected cash requirements are to hit your milestone. And, and you know, as mentioned, you've got to build in future hiring needs uh, and so forth. All of this impacts the dilution as you as founders um, will will um, will will impact will 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 be hit with. Um, you know, you own hundred percent of the company on day one, and it and it goes down over time to a liquidity event. Whether you end up with more or less of the company depends upon how capital efficient your company is. By capital efficient, I mean. Does it have to raise less money to reach that point, that liquidity point in time, or does it does it need more money, more equity? Let's talk about the initial allocation of equity among founders. Um, oftentimes, clients will come to us, and they've already decided which uh, you know what what percentage of the company each founder is getting, which is which is fine. I would say typical um, profile is to have two founders. Um, often not, I would say not a majority of the time, but often they're, they have equal ownership. But when you have a company that has multiple founders, let's say more than three, it would be, I think, illogical and unusual in most cases for the founders to have all equal equity. What investors are gonna be looking at is what is each founder contributed and what are they gonna be contributing going forward? And the people who are more critical to the company, investors will expect to have more equity. And so the key issue here is what percentage interest in e is each founder gonna be getting going forward? As mentioned, each founder must pay for their shares of the, new, of the stock. And ideally, you're paying either cash or a contribution of IP that has um, an equal value to the stock they're receiving. Finally, as mentioned, avoid off-cap table equity, such as promises of options or stock to friends that can be something that can come back to bite uh, the founders when they go out to raise a round. So I see we've got a question here from Raquel. Um, how much dilution is common in a pre-seed or a seed round? A, a lot of that depends on um, you know, 
what your stage of the company is, I would say that if you're doing most, most seed rounds or pre-seed round is structured as a safe or um, a convertible note, which, which means that it's a, you don't need to determine a valuation. It's a non-priced round. So let's say you raise a million dollars in safes that have a valuation cap of $4 million. The safes are not stock, they're not equity, but they convert into equity on the first priced round. So in the future, when the company raises a priced round, that safe will convert into shares at a discount to what the cash investors are paying at the time. And so as a safe investor, the safe holder is taking more risk because they're investing earlier. So they get a better price uh, when the safes actually uh, convert. The benefit for the company is they don't need to come up with a valuation for the company at the time of the safe round. And that's good because really determining a valuation or a dilution that the safe would incur at that time is really like throwing darts at a board. Who knows? It's so early. It's very difficult to say. But I will say this, that if you have a safe uh, that has a cap of $4 million and you're raising a million dollars under that safe, then that safe or the safes that you sell under that financing structure will convert into at least 20% of the company at the time of the priced round. And the new investor won't be diluted by that. That 20% will come out of the founders and the employees at that time. So I would say that most safe rounds that I'm seeing these days are anywhere between $500,000 to $2 million. Um, and the caps are actually higher than $4 million. Uh, they're, I mean, it, it, it is now at least still for early stage investors, a, a very positive time to be raising money. And so we're seeing fairly high caps on safes. Um, so a lot depends on how much you need to raise at the safe round in order to hit the milestones that will enable the company to raise a price round. So this is, I have a whole separate presentation on safes and early stage financings that maybe I can do next time, but it's a, it's a great question. Thank you very much. I'm sorry? Nothing. Thank you very much for your answer. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, one other issue that you should be aware of when you're issuing stock of a corporation, be it to the founders, be it to investors, be it to employees, that all issuance of stock have to comply with securities laws. And the securities laws in the U.S. consist of two sort of regimes. One is a federal securities laws, and the other is under each state in which a recipient resides. And for company, for startups, which are private companies, you have to fit the offering of securities under an exemption. And there's a number of different requirements for exemptions, but they can be broadly classified into two categories. One set of them exemptions which is applicable to investors are um, termed uh, the accredited investor exemption. So you either have to be a sophisticated or accredited investor to be issued shares. Um, the other type of exemption applies to um, employees and service providers that do not require you to be accredited investor or knowledgeable. But that's something that you always need to think about when you're issuing stock. For the most part, with founders issuances and um, safes, it's usually not a long thought process. It's usually pretty straightforward. But it is something that um, is a legal requirement. I'm going to skip this.
let's talk about properly structuring your first round of funding. We talked a little bit about this with Raquel's question about the, the safe dilution. Um, as mentioned, your first round of funding may very well be a safe round. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with those types of instruments, but as mentioned, it is a non-priced um, vehicle for financing companies. It doesn't require that you come up with a valuation of your company or sell a, a certain percentage interest of your company to investors. That will be decided once the safes convert into a priced round. It also means that these safe investors get very few rights, uh, unlike investors in a priced round who are getting stock. Um, and that's the other reason why most of these rounds are done as safes. This slide provides an overview of sort of the early funding structures. As I mentioned, convertible notes or safes, convertible notes and safes are substantially the same. The difference between a convertible note and a safe is a convertible note is debt that you have to pay interest on. It has a, it has a maturity date that it comes due on if it doesn't convert, whereas a safe converts like a convertible note, but it doesn't have any interest and it doesn't have a maturity date. And so I would say predominantly now, most of these early stage rounds are done as safe financings. There's also a series seed financing round, which is a, actually a priced form of preferred stock, like a series A financing, except it's supposed to be much simpler form of stock. The difference is of course, from the safe is, you actually need to come up with a valuation for the company if you're issuing preferred stock. Um, you also end up giving investors uh, a set of preferred stock rights, although they're not as complex as Series A preferred stock rights. They're usually more simple. But a Series C preferred stock round is, I would say, meaningfully more involved and complex than a safe round. It'll take more time, it'll cost more, and you'll end up providing the series seed investors with a set of rights that the safe investors will, will, would not have had. So um, that is it. I am going to, here, here's sort of the overview of the seven things that are sort of the most important things to think about when you're starting early stage. I would say in respect to an earlier question, it's important to get counsel involved early because these issues are, I think would be perceived by most of you as highly technical and nitpicky, but they can matter. And um, as you know, if, if, if things are not, uh, are overlooked early on, they can't, they have a way of, um, uh, fermenting into more significant issues down the road and more costly issues down the road. So I'll pause there and um, I'm available to talk, of course, with any questions, but I, I, I would like to maybe open it up to people if they have any questions they wanna, wanna talk about. Yeah, I mean, we can just rotate through the questions. Anyone here uh, would like that? Yeah, we got a question coming up. Even in the people in Zoom, you guys can raise your hands if that's cool. So we got one uh, one person coming up. Okay, All right. Hey, how's it going? Um, I just I was wondering um, if you could expand a bit more about the second point, like specifically um, when you're using like technologies that. Um, uh, for instance, not like proprietary, but maybe um, uh, like uh, on the like public domain or um, mm -hmm. uh, like shared among like numerous uh, entities or companies and stuff. Um, well, like, what's the best way of like navigating that and figuring out, you know, what all the uh, like the property rights are and stuff, and and um, and how do you like be thorough in making sure that the company owns all the intellectual property and doesn't end up in any um, uh, like difficult situations. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
it's it, it's a good question, and I think the um, you know if 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 IP broadly defined uh, or content is in the public domain, I think you're pretty safe in in using it. Um, I think where things can get a bit tricky is with respect to developments, information um, that has been developed by a prior, by a, by a founder at a prior employer or why they were working for somebody else, that will inevitably be covered by an agreement that was signed by that other, uh, by the employee at the time they were working for that other employer. And so, while there may be arguments that this is different, the IP that they're using for the new company is different. Um, if there's ambiguity and uncertainty around that, that can be as bad as, you know, using information or IP that clearly is not owned because the uncertainty, you want to make sure that there isn't any uncertainty in terms of whether the company owns its IP because a new investor coming in is going to want you guys as the founders to represent that the company owns all its IP, no exceptions, no ifs, ands, or buts. There's a couple rules of thumb. If you're working at another company and you're thinking of starting a new venture, one, don't use any of the company's equipment um, or property to develop um, your new venture's IP. That includes email. Don't even use the employer's email. Don't uh, work on your new company's idea during any working hours um, uh, or using any software uh, of, your, um, of the employer. Uh, if it's something that you think is close to the line, consider whether it makes sense to get permission from your employer. That can be a two-edged sword because you wake a sleeping, a sleeping dog uh, potentially, but at the same time, you'd rather them say, yeah, we have a problem with this. Uh, most employers will work through it with their employees. They'll understand, I understand that this means that you're going to be sort of disclosing that you may be moving on. Um, but it's better than creating the ambiguity um, uh, 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 with your new venture. So those are, those are just, a, just a couple a couple of tips. No, and also, when you leave your, leave your old employer, do not take anything with you. Do not take any files. Don't download anything. Don't take any equipment, cell phone, none of it, unless they give it to you and they wipe it. Oh, yeah, thanks so much. Um, and so just like touching on that point about you know, when you're using online resources and stuff that's maybe not like explicitly defined, um, would you uh, like recommend uh, like not using it if it's not like, um, it, it's not like explicitly, uh, like the, the property rights and the permissions are not explicitly defined or would you um, maybe advocate like reaching out to people um, about it or, you know, trying to like, uh, uh, you know, trying to contact someone who can provide that information? I think I think um, it really depends on the context. I mean, if it's if it's general research and I mean to sort of research what you're doing, it it depends um, quite a bit. I mean, I think there is there's a culture in the Silicon Valley. I think it's shifted a little bit over the last 10, 15 years, but there's a sort of a hacker culture. You know, um, don't don't ask for permission first. You know, beg for forgiveness after the fact. And there's examples of companies that have done that and been successful. Um, it's risky, you know, for instance, there are a lot of companies that have developed their business models by scraping uh, uh, content on the internet from other sites, from, from third-party sites, which arguably would violate uh, the copyright of those other sites and or the terms of use of those other sites. That's just one example. That can be risky, but it can also provide a startup with a huge heads up, you know, head start on um, on on getting traction on its business. So it, it, it's it's a it's a difficult question to answer in the abstract because it would really require weighing the pros and the cons and the risks and the specific type of 
information and what you're going to be using it for. Cool. Yeah. Thanks so much. And just one last thing. Um, uh, I may have missed this, but um, would you like recommend like how much would you recommend uh, like uh, spending on um, on on finding a good lawyer, especially in the early stage, like maybe like prior to safe rounds or like prior to like, um, uh, you know, funding, like would you recommend uh, getting legal help and seeking that stuff? Like if, if you're yeah, I mean, if you're raising money, I would recommend you reach out to a lawyer who worked with startups and is familiar with these issues because it's going to end up saving you, you know, in the long run, you'll end up structuring things properly and it'll end up saving you a lot of money. And there's also good, good counsel can be able to provide you with market information on what's reasonable terms for safes as well. So it may also improve the terms of your safe round. I mean, um, in terms of how much it, it really depends on, you know, the complexity surrounding your business, how many founders, um, do you have employees, uh, how much are you going to be raising from safe investors and how many safe investors are going to be involved in, in your, in your uh, financing. Yeah, cool. Thanks so much. Sure. Hello. Can you Hello. Um, this is pretty similar to the last question, but if some of your technology uses public APIs or open source code, um, mm -hmm. what are some of the things to take into consideration in the long term? It's a great question. Um, very important to understand precisely the terms of the open source license that you're using and what kind of requirements that that imposes on your ability um, to, to license that information, use that information. I'd be particularly uh, careful if you're incorporating open source code into your products um, that you're generating revenue from. So this is a, something that is worth talking about as you develop your business model and developing your products with your IP counsel. And that's, that's something that, you know, you know, that I would recommend refer you to, uh, you know, in our firm, for instance, we have a full IP group that works on patent, trademarks, copyrights, software, including an open source group. And so open source is, um, there's a lot of open source companies and there's a, there's, um, a tried and true way to navigate the different licenses and to make sure that you're not um, going to be incorporating any open source terms that may prove to be very problematic going forward. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Does anyone on Zoom have any questions? Yes, Jacqueline, you do get access to the slides. Oh, which slides would you be talking about? Anyone else have any questions for Sam? So, yeah, I do. Okay, perfect. Right, so Sam, um, in terms of the IP of your workforce, so let's say you are hiring an intern, and then this intern is doing some work, and then he develops something for you. Mm -hmm. What are the concerns or the implications of actually hiring an intern? Because I think this is kind of like a delicate topic, right? It can be. I, I think the most important thing is that you have the intern. So when you say intern, do you mean that you're not paying that person? Yeah, an internship, yeah. an unpaid internship. Yeah. So first of all, I would make sure that they sign an agreement acknowledging that anything they develop any information that they produce is owned by the company. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is really an employment law issue, is whether or not you can, you can have a, a service provider that you're not paying any money to, any, any wages to, and still get the fruits of their uh, labor. 
And California and a lot of other states have minimum wage laws that you have to um, pay for. There are exceptions for interns, but they're very narrowly circumscribed. And so a lot depends on where this intern is, what are the circumstances under which he or she is being, um, being used and so forth. I'd be careful about if, you know, whether or not they're, if they're doing extremely sensitive stuff, I would make sure that you pay them something. Mm -hmm. Even so, even if someone approaches you and, and says, okay, I want to work with you. I want to do an internship and then you can offer them something. Um, from, from, your, better... from your perspective, yes. I don't, I don't know if, you know, when you say an intern, is this something that's coming through the university or? Yeah. Yeah, I would have to look at the rules of the university and what the university thinks about that. Okay, okay. Thank you, Sam. Sure. Anyone else have any questions? Zoom or in person? Any questions? No? All right, then. I mean, give it a few more moments. Let's see. Somebody has their hand raised. Okay. I think that's it then, Sam. Oh, oh, everything's clear. All right. Well, I think we can call it here then. Uh, okay. Well, thank, thank you, so Andrew. Much. Yeah. Uh, my 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 pleasure.